me on the panel. Uh, as I said yesterday in another meeting, uh, God created the earth and the Dutch created the Netherlands. <laughs> uh, because 7 million people will be below sea level if we have not had, hadn't done so. Uh, and Schiphol Airport, which is the second biggest airport in Europe, is 4 meters below sea level. So it is really a day-to-day -day big issue uh, for us. My vision on this is that where the Netherlands is already leading now in water management, in uh, uh, food security, we are the second biggest export of agricultural products in the world, I want us also to be leading in climate change, uh, in uh, tackling the environmental impact. And by doing that, not only making sure that we have the CO2 emissions coming down and uh, moving to the 1.5 degrees Paris targets, but at the same time earning a lot of money, creating new businesses, new innovations, etc. For that, we need to bring the targets up. I believe that Europe's targets are too low. We are now working on a 49% target. Uh, a plan for 2030. Uh, Europe is still at this moment at 40%. Next year we have to decide what the target will be. Uh, together with France, with Emmanuel Macron, we are very much pushing for a target of 55% for the uh, EU. Uh, of course, at the same time, we have to make sure that the targets worldwide stay in place. And uh, particularly with the US a challenge, uh, keep China fully on board. I think that's working at the moment, uh, but also the other parts of the world. Uh, and having said that, of course, nationally, we need support for this. Uh, what we have done is we have brought together a large group of people working on all the aspects of uh, climate change and the environmental impact. That has led to a draft agreement, uh, which is now being um, thought through by all the relevant agencies. We will get it back as politicians. In April, then we have to take decisions. And then I believe we have to look at three things. One, can people afford it? So that it is still possible, and this is something I would really learn, like to learn from you, what you are doing in this area, that people can make this transition in their personal lives without having to skip holidays or moving homes or whatever, mm. but that it, they are able to do this uh, whilst maintaining a lifestyle. Secondly, that we all understand what we personally can do to contribute in a very practical sense to this. When I have to buy a new car, should I still buy a petrol-driven car, or a powered car, or should I buy an electrical car? And what are the trade-offs, and how does this all play out, etc. And finally, we have to make sure that, there is a, uh, that it is fair how we distribute all of this between the companies and the people. That companies, of course, are crucial for your economic uh, competitiveness, but at the same time, we have to make sure that they are not uh, unfairly uh, handled in the sense that they are doing not, uh, not doing enough, whilst we are asking a lot of the burden being shared by the people themselves. Um, and, uh, of course, a final one is the level playing, field, level playing field. When we in the Netherlands would do more than Germany or Belgium, it would be silly. Uh, if we close a, a coal-powered plant whilst a brown coal plant is being opened in Germany, uh, why are we doing that? So we have to be very careful in calibr calibrating this, choreographing this, in such a way that we make sure that uh, the country stays competitive, becomes even more competitive, and that we are not basically exporting the problem uh, to another country, which would then uh, basically uh, see its emissions going up, and then you can't build a wall in the air that would still then come to the Netherlands. So all these issues, I believe, we have to take into account. But the most interesting thing for this panel, I think, will be this issue of uh, how do we maintain the support with the general population, how to do that. Right, and I'm interested in following up on that relationship you mentioned as well in terms of the national borders because in Europe it's a very singular situation because there's so many countries yep. so close together. Rachel, 28, soon 27. Yep. <laughs> right, it, it is a changing number. Yep. Um, Rachel, I want to I talk to you because according to the UN Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the IPCC, the world has 12 years left to prevent um, catastrophic global warming. How can the world's major economies use their combined market power to speed up climate-friendly development? Uh, well, thank you. It's a, it's a real pleasure to be here. <clears throat> so this, the report that, to which you refer um, was um, uh, an opportunity to hit the reset button um, and recalibrate <coughs> again um, the ambition that uh, that has to be part of the dialogue between political leaders and people. And I'll come back to that at the moment. What it did, it, so there has been tremendous progress. 
Uh, I mean, if you, if you sit in the energy discussions here in Aspen and you ask anybody if 10 years ago we predicted we would be where we are today in the price of renewable energy, the price of storage for renewable energy, I, 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 if, if somebody said that they knew, I, I doubt it, right? So I, there is tremendous progress, but we have to now set the reset button because we, you know, the climate is outpacing us, the climate change is racing and we're walking. So now what we do is we have an extraordinary opportunity to, to hit the reset button. And we, there are a lot of known, no, we know a lot of what we need to do. And this is the public-private uh, dance that we have to dance a little bit more quickly than we have. And it's, it's not a polka anymore, it's a tarantella. Yeah. The public sector, what government has to do is set very clearly the point on the horizon to which it wants to go. And the EU's done that, and they need to keep ratcheting it up and ratcheting it up. Once you have that kind of policy certainty, what we can see is that the private sector will shift its R&D on its own. R&D will shift into the technologies, into the solutions that will work for a decarbonised economy. That happens. The public, public sector can also do a lot to induce that through procurement and things like that. So it's this dance between the public and the private sector. But the public becomes very important because we are now on an emergency footing. We have run out of time. And across Europe, we have rebellions, right? Today, we have 35,000 school students on the streets of Brussels saying we want action now. And that's different because that's not, okay, we need an incremental improvement over, you know, this is like, what do we do to have transformative change? And so there is an energy transition, the deep decarbonisation of our energy systems, renewable energy, it's starting to happen. There's much better signalling that could be sent. End the fossil fuel subsidies. There are still fossil fuel subsidies from G7 countries. That's ridiculous. We agreed mm. in Germany that that would stop. The G20 has to start picking up the pace on that as well. So why we are subsidising what we know is killing our children, poisoning them, and, and also affecting their ability to learn is, is kind of beyond me. And it's certainly beyond the students on the streets of Brussels today. So the energy transition speeded up. What we now know is that the things that use energy very inefficiently or very intensively, like steel, like cement, like chemicals, like heavy transport, shipping and aviation and trucks and, and buses, we now know that we can actually get in 2050 to a place where they can be zero carbon as well, technologically. So can we now set the standards and have the policy pull for that as well and allow the private sector uh, to innovate into that space? So it's every piece of the economy. What doesn't get talked about enough? We have to eat differently. Our diets have to be different. But this isn't about sacrifice. There is an opportunity to do this inclusively. It can be done affordably. We're, we're, we're still throwing bad money after bad money, perhaps one day it was good money 50, 100 years ago. But So we, we are not being consistent and coherent across all of our economies. And when we start to do that, I think we start to see the pace of change start. So what's new today? The UN report took all plausible deniability away from any business leader, any government leader, any student leader, any mayor. We now know the size of the challenge and the time frame we have to work within. And so the question is, where do we create the spaces for the courage for political leaders to set the policy landscape? And then what is the pressure on business leaders to go as fast as they can into those spaces? Those spaces can deliver electricity, food, water, at affordable, reliable, uh, in affordable and reliable systems, but it's going to take a new way of thinking about it. Good news, technology exists, digitalization, decentralization, whether it's water or energy, we know that this is what's already happening. <laughs> And, you know, I think there's a bright, new, green, clean world out there which young people want, and it's our responsibility to build it for them. Well, thank you. There's a lot to drill down there. We're going to get back to some of those things. I, I do want to switch over to Ma Jun. And first of all, maybe you can talk a little bit about your background, because I was looking at your resume, and it's, it's a really, you know, very impressive, um, you know, thing to look at. You've done a lot of really interesting and cool things. And then also, you know, China... Boy, you know, you could really argue they're the poster child for, you know, some bad things with regard to pollution and carbon. And um, I'd love it if you could just give us an overview of where things stand there. Sure. <clears throat> Thank you, Andy. Um, I probably start with a couple of things I'm doing uh, and going back a little bit on what China been doing on green finance and what we've been pushing in the international space through G20 and Central Bank Network of Green Finance. 
Um, back uh, five years ago, when I joined the Central Bank of China as chief economist, I kicked off this uh, green finance uh, uh, task force um, in which we proposed 14 actions for the central government to build what we call a green financial system. Um, the idea was very simple. Uh, it wasn't so much of a, uh, sort of a risk management and so on. It's really about mobilization uh, because China needs to invest in many green areas, for example, clean energy, uh, green building, clean transportation, uh, environmental protection, and so on and so forth uh, in an annual amount of 4 trillion RMB per year. Uh, that was a conservative estimate, in fact, but it was done back a few years ago. And I told the government that uh, only 10% of that amount can be covered by government budget. 90% of all the good things needs to be done with private sector money. So <clears throat> you need to do something. Otherwise, all the targets that you're setting for reducing air pollution, uh, for reducing water pollution, land contamination, carbon reduction are not going to be possible. So <clears throat> that was the body by the government. And second year, it became a mandate from the central government for the PBOC to lead the drafting of a green finance guideline. Um, this is something I spent like a year working on, coordinating seven ministries, and we came up with uh, 35 actions, uh, consolidating all the resources, the fiscal, the uh, central bank, uh, the monetary, uh, the uh, banking authority, the so stock exchange, and the Ministry of Environment, uh, and NDRC, which is the planning agency. So uh, in order to enforce all these actions which intend to promote a, a green finance market or greening the finance of the assistant, uh, we made sure that every single action is assigned to an individual ministry, individual bureau, an individual person, and uh, it has to be delivered by a certain date. This is what we call a division of labor document that came out after the guideline. Now that's something I was very proud of doing and uh, I see the implementation of this document as much better than many other documents. So what we did in the last few years, uh, just very briefly, are the following. Number one, we created taxonomies <laughs> for green finance. Namely, we defined green loans and green bonds. Uh, I think these are the first national level definitions in the world. Only with that definition, you'll be able to really channel the right amount of uh, dollars to the right sectors and right projects. And you can prevent greenwashing and uh, you can create products and so on. Second thing we did was to introduce a disclosure requirement. And uh, we said it's going to be a three-year um, <clears throat> sort of a action plan. And the last step is by 2020, all listed companies will have to disclose environmental information. No excuse. Uh, it's not a uh, voluntary uh, system. It's not a semi-voluntary system. It's a compulsory system. And I think by then, if China achieved this uh, <clears throat> goal, uh, we will become the first large economy that has introduced a compulsory requirement for environmental and climate information disclosure, which will include, I think, the CO2 emission, the SO2 emission, the NOx emission, the COD, energy consumption, and uh, <clears throat> water consumption. Now, this is very powerful because only with such information will the capital market be able to identify which project is green, which project is not green, will be able to channel the right amount of money to the right <clears throat> sector. The third thing we did was uh, introducing incentives. We know that uh, some of the green projects, low carbon projects, are not profitable enough. Of course, there are profitable ones, which you know, a lot of banks are doing. And uh, these are the externalities. And uh, we need to overcome <coughs> externality with some incentive. So Central Bank came in with uh, it's a PBOC re-lending facility for green, which means that uh, we, the Central Bank, lend money cheaply to the commercial bank. And we ask you to lend cheaply to the project. Uh, roughly by one percentage points lower than the market. And also we ask the local governments to subsidize or guarantee the green projects. In Jiangsu province, uh, which is one of the large provinces in China, they subsidize 30% of interest payments of a green bond. Mm. And it does change behavior. I was there just a, you know, a few weeks ago. I saw the companies which didn't want to issue green bonds for green projects. They changed their behavior. They did it. And uh, the last thing uh, is really we need to create a lot of products to uh, be tailor-made for different type of green projects. For example, some short-term projects can be financed by short-term bank loans, but many long-term projects will have to be financed with long-term money. Uh, that's why we created the green bond market. China was a latecomer. Uh, it's 10 years after the first European green bond was issued. We did it in 2016. But in that year, China became the largest green bond market in the world. Mm -hmm. In the last three years, uh, since we launched the green bond market, we issued more than 100 billion US dollars on green bonds.
mm. and it's still growing, I think, uh, very, very strongly. The many other products which you are creating, you know, green insurance, uh, the carbon collateral, you know, for financing and so on and so forth, which I see clearly uh, improve the flow of money, you know, to the green sector and also inspire a lot of other countries to, uh, you know, kick off their, their green financial policies. Well, thank you very much for that. And it's actually um, a relief, uh, to, at least to me personally, to hear all this going on in China because, you know, for those of us who go to Beijing and see the air and then read the stories about those CO2 emissions, sometimes, you know, we don't see perhaps the pro proce projects uh, that we'd like to see there, that we'd, you know, the, the, the headway. And so uh, I, I'm, I'm very happy to hear that you're fighting the fight. I'm going to ask you some more questions about that. Um, I'd like to go over to uh, Feike, though, and, and ask you about your company, uh, Royal DSM. And, you know, it, it's, you guys were a dirty company, right? Thank you very much. Yes, <laughs> and uh, you're welcome. But they've changed. They've gotten uh, a lot of new ways and new thinking. I'm sorry, I don't mean to make fun of you at all, poke fun of you, but you're a good sport. Oh, you can handle you it. You can handle it good. <laughs> you know him a little bit. Um, and uh, tell it next to me. <laughs> yeah, you better be careful. Um, so tell us about what's going on with your company and the, and the changes that, that have been brought about. Yeah. Now, to, to make that point right, uh, indeed, we have a very polluting background, DSM, uh, Dutch State Mines. But we are not, yeah, no, we have with the Prime Minister next to me, we are still Dutch, but not really. Uh, we are not owned by the state, that's clear, anymore, and we have no mines, but we kept the three letters. And we changed from a mining company to a chemical company and now to a science-based company, world's largest uh, food and nutritional ingredient manufacturer and sustainable materials for energy, etc. I think climate change is, is the maybe biggest challenge we have in mankind. We... Uh, adapted ourselves by adapting this uh, environment towards us, and we overdid that a little bit. We will get to have to deal with a huge amount of refugees. We cannot deal with the war refugees today. We will get uh, financial instability if we don't uh, deal with it. And my biggest fear is if we don't do it fast enough, that the permafrost in Siberia and Greenland will be melting. I don't know whether you're aware. But as we speak, every single day, we get holes twice of this room of methane burst in Greenland and Siberia. As we speak, last two years, for the first time, uh, noticed uh, due to the permafrost, which is a little bit weak, and the methane get evaporated. Very difficult. As a chemical company, a runaway reaction, then there is no management needed anymore. Then science and nature takes it over. So what do we need to do? Uh, like Rachel, uh, which whom I had the pleasure of cooperating for many, many years in private-public partnerships, um, it, it needs to be done by both, companies and countries. Countries have the privilege to make regulations, laws, etc. Countries have also the privilege to uh, give subsidies, uh, four to five hundred billion fossil subsidies every single year. Countries could stop with that. That would be a, a great uh, step forward. Um, so there are things countries can do. There are things companies can do. Companies can step forward and, and, and do more. And of course, companies will struggle with exactly the same point the Prime Minister made. Uh, if I step forward and I do more, do more than the competition, do I outcompete myself? Or do I make it more difficult for myself? Uh, or should I wait for regulations, then we all get the level playing field. We and many other companies do not wait for regulations and step forward voluntarily and do more than needed. And that is jeopardizing our competitiveness to a certain degree. Are we stupid? Why are we doing that? No, because that is leadership, I believe, to step forward and to do more than may be uh, needed. Also, to be honest, to a self-interest, also to a self-interest, because I want to future-proof our organization. I want to future-proof our company. I think if we don't do it, the millennials will not work for our company anymore. Mm -hmm. We will not buy our products. We lose our license to operate from society. We are not prepared on the carbon price, and we will lose out as a company. So I do that also as self-interest. I'm leading a group, and I just came out of uh, uh, the meeting uh, we, we have regularly with them, of 80 companies called the CEO Climate Leader Group. What do we agree? We agreed to voluntarily increase our own reduction targets 
science-based targets. We agreed to put an internal price on carbon, stimulating governance to put a stronger price on carbon. Sidestep on that one. I'm also leading another commission uh, dealing with the competitiveness impact of carbon price. Hopefully in September, we come with a conclusion. My feeling a little bit, a carbon price of 30 to 50 is impactful enough for companies to react, but not big enough for companies to move the assets to another country. Taxation, labor arbitrage, IP, there are many other considerations to make. So this might be interesting, and I personally think this is important. Next to targets, carbon pricing, more innovations, and more financial disclosure of what we are doing. And that is what we are committing ourselves. And I see that also the financial sector, to my June's point, is also increasingly uh, interested in this. Uh, we need to revolve our credit facilities with the banks. And we said to the banks, we need to pay a fee for that. And what if we pay a lower fee if we reduce our emissions more? So what has those two things to do? Well, with future-proofing our company towards the future, would you banks not be interested to give a lower fee we need to pay when we green our company faster? And we got that done. So the financial sector, to my June's point, is also changing. And it's future-proofing, I think, its portfolio of things they hold. Same as Lyon Fink or BlackRock made his statement today. Last point, and, and I stop. My big concern is the point the Prime Minister also made. At the end of the day, how do we divide the bill? And, and I'm concerned that the feeling with a lot of people in our society is, okay, we have maybe economic downturn, maybe this, maybe that, and now we need to pay also the climate bill. Mamma mia, where does it stop? And there is a part of population which did not benefit from globalization. And I think that point needs to be addressed. You cannot transition a company, you cannot transition a country, you cannot transition society if you don't take the people with you. And there, I think we have still a big challenge. Thank you, Fika. Mama Mia, indeed. I like that. <laughs> that was great. Christian, you've been very patient letting all of your guests. I'm Swiss. Go, go first. I, I really, exactly, yes, exactly. He, it doesn't bother him, it really doesn't. Um, I want to ask you uh, from the Swiss Re perspective, though, uh, it would seem to me that your role here would be one of risk and understanding the risks that climate change have. I'm hoping that's some perspective that you can bring to this discussion. Um, and, and so from uh, financial services and insurance perspective, how can you participate? Um, and I love that idea of telling the bank you know, charge us less. I mean, are, are there ways that you can participate like that to um, further this agenda? It's always tough to negotiate with Dutch people, right? I, I don't <laughs> want to give insurance cover to Fike. He's going to uh, ask for a reduction. Yes, uh, yes, that, you so, can see a straight. He's going to guilt you, <laughs> right? right? Yeah. That's so, excellent. Uh, maybe two perspectives, right? Uh, I think one perspective is uh, we're at the receiving end of, of climate change, right? As the insurer of insurers, we insure the biggest catastrophes in the world. Yes. Uh, and so we have observed that over time. And the, the second perspective is maybe us as a company, as a, just as a normal company, what we do about that. So when it comes to climate change, uh, we were relatively early, I think in uh, 93 we published that we think this is a real risk. Right? As, a, as a risk knowledge company, we put that out there. But uh, as one of the first companies, but uh, nobody listened, right? No, nobody cared. It was a bit of science fiction. And uh, for 10 years, nothing happened. And then we thought we should, uh, we should start to talk much more about that to politicians, the UN, et cetera. And that was part of that effort. And we toured the world, and we had skeptical audiences, right? Everywhere where I went at the time, yeah, 2000, 2001, 2005. And up to mid-2000s, I think, in a private room, uh, a lot of CEOs would not really believe climate change is real. Right? Whatever we say, whatever we prove, et cetera. Now, I think, the, and then the financial crisis took attention away from that topic for a few years. And uh, my feeling is, uh, it's always hard not to get depressed over time since I've on these panels for a long time. I actually feel there's a bit more momentum right now. I think there's more recognition. I think the reports are stronger. The science is stronger. More people see it. I think the, the fact that uh, 2017 was the heaviest natural catastrophe year yeah. ever in terms of costs, and that's only half of the economic losses covered by insurance. But, but that was the highest. Last year was pretty bad too, above average. Um, so at, at least I, I feel there's more momentum now in, in honesty in, in a smaller circle. Um, whether that now helps to 
catch up because we have lost so much time, right? so much time from 93 to now uh, remains to be seen. Right? Sometimes you can have exponential phenomenon and if enough people believe in it, maybe we're, we're lucky. But I just say we have lost a lot of time and, and it's, it's running out. So that's, that's you know, my professional perspective from a, from a, as a reinsurer. As a, as a company, maybe that's the, the parallel track. Right? Obviously, very early on, we tried to do something our own. So we supported uh, windmills and solar projects on the insurance side. Uh, we, we lowered our carbon footprint to zero, but that's not a heroic thing, right? For a reinsurer, we don't have a heavy uh, footprint. So we reduced where we could, and then we paid uh, for, for the rest. Uh, but more recently, it's more interesting, right? Because uh, you have to look at your whole value chain and what you influence. And in 17, and so it took us that long, right? In, in 2017, the younger people in our asset management department uh, made an analysis back. We we're a bond holder, right? 130 billion of bonds. We, mm -hmm. That's policyholder money. Um, and they analyzed the last five years of uh, corporate bonds, and they said we should we, we should switch to uh, you know um, ESG uh, indices for the whole for, for some some of the assets because they have actually performed about the same level but with lower volatility. So it's a good mm -hmm. thing. And so they came to the executive board, and we said, okay, what percentage of these 130 billion would like to switch? And they said um, everything. <coughs> <laughs> yep. Um, so we paused That's a little while. <laughs> Uh, and we, we agreed to do it, right? So we wow. switched in 17, everything, 130 billion uh, ESG. And, and obviously everybody's nervous, right? Is it performing as well? It's performing actually better since then. So we're, we're lucky on that side, but it, it needed a bit of courage, right? We were one of the first. On the underwriting side, we also support all kinds of companies. So what can we do there? And it's clear we also there uh, need to go further in encouraging certain behavior mm -hmm. or discouraging certain other behavior. But when you go there, you need a lot of courage. Whatever you do, you'll be criticized. Mm -hmm. And so this year we came out with a policy where we thought we need to support some of the emerging economies on the transition. So we, mm -hmm. we can insure coal mines in China because China indeed is making the biggest progress, we think. But in, in, in mature economies, as we said before, it makes no sense to reopen a coal mine. No. Now, obviously, others can say, no, you should, you should insure it. We decided not to. The business loss is not huge, but there you start to talk real money. Mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, and I think it's just, I would just encourage people to contribute through their own value chain, whatever they can uh, in this whole right. process, just because of the urgency. And then final point, you, you might say our shareholders don't want that, right? But it's not true. Right? We go and talk to all the shareholders. You, you noticed, and I think Fike has said it, there's a huge wave coming with pension funds, sovereign funds, et cetera, who say, what are you doing in that field? Mm. So actually, it's, a, it's an intelligent thing to do, right? Plus right. the millennial in, in your own business. So I, I think there's ample cases for CEO to take more courageous actions, and you won't always get it right, and you will, you will be criticized. Thank you. I always thought the most powerful argument for climate change being a real problem was the insurance companies, because you can listen to NGOs and people say, yeah, yeah, yeah. You can even listen to heads of state. But the insurance companies saying it's, it's real because it, you know, we're, it's costing us money, right? So you know, we, here's the evidence. We're paying out more. And so I think that's a fascinating point. Um, OK, we're going to go around and talk to people again. We're going to be a little quicker this time after those kind of opening statements. And I want to ask you, uh, Prime Minister Ruta, about your conversations. Take us behind the scenes when you talk to other heads of state, the most mm. confidential conversations that you have with other heads of state and uh, EU regulators, um, and, and maybe talk a little bit about uh, the problem that FICA identified, which is the cost and the trade-offs, and, and how do you pay for that? And, which countries are doing it right and which countries are not. <laughs> All that gossipy stuff. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. Because we are amongst ourselves. Yeah, there's no one <laughs> could possibly be listening. There's the right. cameras brought yeah. past. No, no, no. <laughs> Let me say a few things. Uh, first of all, uh, with Sigrid Kaag, uh, Minister for uh, Foreign Aid and Foreign Trade of the Netherlands, I visited Guterres, the Secretary General of NATO, last year, September, during the UN week. He was very worried. And he said, we need leadership from countries like the Netherlands, but also France, New Zealand, countries in Africa, uh, countries like China, uh, in, in Latin America, to make sure that as a world community, we keep committing to the Paris Climate Agreement. We have now seen in Katowice that we were able to agree on a rule book, um, but we were not able to uh, get an agreement on an international uh, carbon uh, uh, measuring system. That has not been achieved, and we need it yeah. urgently. So uh, uh, I took that on board. Uh, I spoke this morning, for example, with the new. Uh, now she's not that new anymore. The new the prime minister of New Zealand, 
uh, and many others. Uh, and uh, this is one thing. So how to make sure that in, in the regional discussions, we maintain uh, that level of ambition uh, collectively. Because as Feike was saying, if we don't, um, and he was mentioning this example of the um, permafrost uh, situation in, in Russia, then you could have a sort of acceleration and uh, that would have an enormous impact. So I'm very much committed to do that. At the same time, I want my country to stay competitive. Yeah. And I do believe that we can do this in such a way that people, that we can take the people along, that we have more jobs and more uh, innovation, etc. And I do believe that we can all do that. <coughs> For example, I spoke this morning with uh, President Bolson, uh, the new president of uh, Brazil, uh, yeah. and there's the paradox that the large agricultural sector in Brazil is negatively impacted at this moment uh, by the fact that there are so many environmental issues in that part of Latin America. Mm -hmm. This is a paradox, because you would always think there's either you are in favor of the, of the farmers or you're in favor of handling this issue of uh, climate change. No, you need to tackle climate change in order for the farmers to still have a business model in the, uh, in the future. Um, Again, at the national level, we have these intricate debates. Uh, the Netherlands, as I said, half the country below sea level, that means that we always had to sit together, all these farmers, all these people, for centuries to decide where the dikes are being built. That means that we have a total disrespect for hierarchy in the Netherlands. We do things ourselves by talking, 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 and then agreeing. And we have tried to do the same with this. I'm not sure we will be successful. I think we can be successful. We have involved over 150 NGOs, uh, societal organizations, uh, local communities, etc., etc., to discuss coming to this draft climate agreement at the national level, uh, on which we have to decide in April. The good thing is that you have a broad level of support. The bad thing is that it takes somewhat more time that you always find out that you might have had this or that organization on board, so you have to get them on board later on. And then we have to be very careful that this uh, citizen perspective, both financially and what can I do in my personal life, but also the business perspective, mm -hmm. is, the, is, it, is, is, the, uh, is it fairly distributed, what we are asking from the people versus what we are asking from companies? And of course, companies will then, in most cases, uh, put this also in their pricing, what they need to do, because they also need to stay competitive. All these issues we have to solve. It is a huge project, right. nationally and internationally. But I am cautiously optimistic that we can maintain uh, the pace. For example, and then I, I will, I will uh, stop talking, when you add up all the European plans currently on the table, you would, it would already, if everybody would implement what they have agreed to, this will, would already bring you to 45% CO2 uh, emission reduction in Europe. Uh, so the target is 40%, yep. but all the current plans on the table, if implemented, would already lead to 45%. We need to bring the target to 55%, I'm absolutely convinced. And right. then again, to mention one positive example, Emmanuel Macron, he also need, wants right. that, and many others. So we have to work on that. You did drop some good ask, names there, uh, by the way. The, the moderator asked us just mm. before we entered, we should ask questions ourselves Absolutely. and even interrupt. It's a two-hour <laughs> prime, two prime minister, also that. So, um, uh, Total disrespect for hiring. Uh, uh, yes, I, <laughs> I know. I noticed. The Netherlands. <laughs> uh, but a, a question I would have to our own prime minister, I'd take my chance. Uh, who is moving faster at this moment? Mm -hmm. Is it governments? Or is companies, not our government, because you are the best no. prime minister no, 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 of all no, no, countries no, 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 no. in the world. No, no, no. No, no. Uh, no. no I this really mean like that, by the way. Stop. But, no. He uh, wants a tax break. To make the point, and because mm -hmm. the c companies are struggling yeah. also with, I mean, we need to right. do it together. Yeah. That's a good, but that's there a good is question. A, it's yeah. a speed I believe, okay. I believe there is no big international issue which we can solve by governments alone. And there is no international big issue which you can solve by governments and NGOs alone. You need the governments, the NGOs, right and the companies, sometimes very small ones, and in many cases the bigger ones. And when I look at the big uh, companies like, like yourselves and AXO and Heineken, I was this morning in a Valuing Water Initiative, uh, Jean-Francois Verbox-Meer, the CEO of Heineken, taking the lead there. Carlsberg was there with the CEO, mm. who is uh, from Dutch origin, uh, on, this, uh, on this water initiative, which has to do, of course, with climate change. Um, but also the big ones, Shell, Shell and Unilever, they're all on the forefront of this. And you need, right. you need these big companies. And also right. they understand there is a license to operate and profit and purpose have, have to mm. uh, work in conjunction. Yeah, Unilever certainly has been yeah. way out front. Um, you mentioned Paris and the Paris Agreements, and I want to talk to you and ask you about that, Rachel, a little bit, because 
we're behind, it doesn't seem like we're gonna hit the targets, and then you hear, oh, we're gonna have to spend a ton of money to get there and no one has the money. This is the same old old song again, right? And what, what's your take on that? Yeah, no, I mean, you know, look, the, the world is awash with, with money. Uh, it's, the question is, who's, who has it? Um, who are they gonna invest it in? And, uh, and, and then where do we, uh, and, and how do we make sure that we leave no one behind as we do that? So this, you know, Paris, you know, Paris set a very clear ambition uh, for, for a world that, where we manage global warming to stay below two degrees. And now basically science is saying, we can't really afford to do that. We're gonna have to get to 1.5. <laughs> Um, but Paris also said that this can't be balanced on the back of poor people. Um, the, the political compact in Paris was that we could do this in a way that brought everybody along. And that means that people can have uh, affordable, reliable, clean energy, that they can have access to safe water, that they can have safe food and things like this. And if that piece of the puzzle is um, left to the side, uh, there is that that political agreement starts to fray very very quickly. It frays at community level, national level. It frays internationally. Right. So uh, I think it's important to remember that that's what the sort of Paris package was. But you know, paying for it, um, there are all kinds of inventive ways. And Marjun has led the charge on this. There are all kinds of inventive ways to harness the financial sector to the productive economy, which is something that we lost over the last few decades. Sure. Climate change notwithstanding, right? The, the financial sector is not driven uh, to, to, to drive our economies forward to, to that kind of purpose that the Prime Minister Rutte talked about. And so, for example, you know, carbon taxes, carbon pricing, Feike's led the charge on this for many years, you know, gets, gets a bad rap because Emmanuel Macron, you know, got his communications wrong, right? Uh, but you look at examples of where it's right, and this has become the electoral issue in Canada, um, where you've actually got uh, experience of revenue neutral carbon pricing. China's about to introduce something. Um, there's a lot of experience of what works, what doesn't work. But let me tell you, if you put a, if you put a carbon price of $50 um, uh, into an economy that looked something like the United States, I'm not saying the United States, uh, and you made it revenue neutral, you could give every taxpayer in, the, in, in a country like the US um, you know, money back that would make them better off than they are today, and you'd have enough left over. And you'd have enough left over to put into the future fund that will help those people who will be displaced or who will suffer in the transition in the short run because their jobs might disappear or because they need to be reskilled and retrained, you would have enough to invest in their future. And I think one very, very important thing is that we have to start telling people the truth, right? The methane bursts, this is scary. But unless we tell people the truth that there is a pathway forward, there's something for everybody to do, I think that that's, it's going to be very difficult to keep sort of, you know, imagining that the public is going to sort of, you know, join us in this crusade when they're scared and when they're frightened and when they're being fed a bunch, of, uh, you know, a tissue of, you know, platitudinous stuff and sometimes falsehoods. And I think that there's real truth coming from authentic business leadership. There's real truth coming from authentic political leadership. You, know, you talked about New Zealand. I think that, uh, I think that you know, New Zealand's got a very difficult pathway. It's got a lot of methane in its economy. It's going to hurt, but they're making the mm. commitment. Europe's making the commitment. And I, I think that that authentic leadership has to come from business and from politicians. And then it gives the public a chance to know how they can you know, be part of the solution. In the meantime, young people are taking to the streets and saying, I'm not waiting. Yeah. I'm not going to have a future. I want a job. I want my kids to be safe. I want to be able to breathe clean air. I mean, they're fairly fundamental requests, and I think you're just going to see that spread. You know, while we're worried about, you know, some of the sort of more populist and sort of nationalist uh, 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 moods which are taking up a lot of the discussion here, right. there, there is another mood on the street which is, you know, I have basic needs. I want to meet them in a green economy, and I want to meet them now. So money is actually not the problem. Uh, and Marjorie Rachel, has proved that. Rachel, if I may say, you said the money is a big wash for money, and the question is who has the money? Right. Well, uh, we know who The has private money. sector has the money. Yeah. But it's concentrated. Because, yeah, but I would answer your own question yeah. by saying the private sector has the money. Because if you look to uh, the financing yes. of our energy transition, 
I don't know what the factor is, whether it's factor 10 or factor 100, which the private sector needs to invest more than the public sector to do the transition. So I don't know whether you agree with me, but I would say what we need to do the transition, we talk here in this panel about leadership of right. for climate, addressing climate change, but I would say the governments need to move faster, so fast that they can unlock the potential of the private sector because right. they need to finance it. Nobody else will really finance it because if I look to the numbers, the money needs to come from them. Or do you disagree but, with No, I think well, just, just very briefly, in, in, one of the reasons why Paris worked is because the, the message from business to government is if you do this, we can deliver. And what's happened since Paris is somehow politically, you know, at an international level, that, that political leadership has come under pressure. We've seen some people hesitating, a bit of a wobble in a few geographies. Mm -hmm. um, and I think the business message here is very, very clear. You know, we need the, we need the long-term targets, we need the strategies, we need you to take, to put coherence across your macroeconomic and your fiscal policies, and if you do, you will be surprised by how fast we can go. So I agree with Fike. Right, but it's different in different countries too. So let's take China, for instance, we're talking about leadership, and I'm interested, Majun, in, in your take on exactly how committed the leadership in China is when it comes to this issue. Uh, maybe I cover both uh, in terms of how we kick off the, uh, the green finance program in China uh, more quickly than many other places. And the other one is really uh, the points that's been made, you know, how do we convert a huge amount of uh, brown money uh, into green money? Uh, the brown money are probably, you know, five, ten times bigger uh, mm -hmm. than the green money. Now, uh, on China, I think uh, uh, it's uh, a little trick, um, you know, to convince the uh, top policy maker uh, that uh, uh, the financial system has to play a critical, uh, critical role in greening the economy. Uh, I think a uh, uh, few things contributing to this uh, understanding. One is uh, we had a massive problem of air pollution in 2013. Um, if you were in Beijing 2013, early in the year, the PM 2.5 number went up to 1,000 in one day. And that was, uh, I think, 50 times higher than a safe level. Mm. So people began to talk about air pollution you know, every day. Uh, they began to you know, watch the, uh, the, the, the hourly based uh, release of the PM2.0 number. Um, and uh, that creates a lot of momentum. And uh, we leveraged that momentum, uh, which is the public momentum saying everybody wants the government to be green and wants the financial system to be green. And secondly, we estimate a huge amount of uh, 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 sort of money that's needed for green investment and telling the government, you don't have the money. You have to rely on the financial system to mobilize the money or to convert the brown money into green money for you. And uh, uh, these are basically two arguments. I think uh, you know, it was very swift. We convinced the government within a few months and it was codified into the highest level of government document. It's called uh, Eco-Civilization Reform Plan put out by the Central Party Committee and the State Council. Now once in Countries like us, developing countries, the top leadership, you know, uh, put this into his mouth, things will move very fast. And uh, then it became, you know, mandates for central bank to draft the regulation and rules and incentives and all that. Then we create a lot of different markets. Just give you an example of the green bond market. Uh, in OECD country, it's largely market driven, right? The market associations will create rules and guidelines and all that. We put in the green bond guideline and the green bond catalog, which I led in drafting, on the central bank website. And we said, you can follow that on a voluntary basis, but 100% of the guys follow them. So this is a convening power of the government once you have yeah. Yeah. the conviction <clears throat> at the, uh, uh, the senior level. Um, so the green bond was an example, and the green funds was another example. We created 400 green equity funds last three years. Uh, also at uh, you know, uh, this push, given this push from the government. Uh, plus, uh, you know, many other innovations, like we're now pushing banks to do environmental stress testing. ICBC has done this and showing to the rest of the financial sector, if you land it to polluting high carbon sectors, you end up with high non-performing loan ratio. Just a model is right. going to shift the composition of the lending. Um, <clears throat> now, back to the second point on, you know, so much money available in the world and only a tiny part uh, is, is in green. Uh, you mentioned ESG investment. I think your company is great, you know a lot of ESG. The world, I think, only have a few percent of institutional money in ESG assets. And in terms of bank's balance sheets, the average bank may have only less than 10% green right. on the balance sheet. Mm -hmm. So what we need to do is to convert you know, much more 
a larger proportion of these non-green brown assets into the green. That's incentive. So the government has to put incentive, not only sort of a economic incentive, sometimes signals are very important. The president, the prime ministers, central bank governor coming out and speak. That's a lot of incentive. And disclosure, it's a huge incentive, basically penalizing those guys who are not doing green. And, uh, you know, of course, uh, some real incentive, money type of incentive will be needed. Um, I do want, Christian, I don't want to short shrift you, but I, I do want to throw the floor open uh, for questions because I know that some people out here probably want to ask the panel some questions. Um, we've got a, a gentleman right here. If we get a microphone to just hang on one second. And maybe if anyone has a question for Christian so he doesn't feel left out. <laughs> no, I'm I'll, okay. I'll, I'll loop back it. to you. You can take it. Okay, great. Hi, I'm uh, Jaydeep. I'm a global shaper from India, and I work on bringing clean energy access to the remote communities in Himalayas by displacing kerosene with solar. My question is uh, that we have talked about organizations and governments, but what about the people themselves? So in India, Africa, if you look at the average amount of per capita consumption, uh, emission of carbons, it's somewhere between 0.5 to 1.5. And whereas if you take the developed world, it's up to 8 and 9. And soon enough, these people, as the income levels are increasing, will eventually end up at those levels. So how do you sort of reach out to these people, both in the developed part of the world, where you tell them you need to get your emissions down, but then the people who are starting this journey, how can we ensure that they make the responsible choices and not end up with the same amount of carbon emissions that people in the developed world already have? Yeah, good question. Now, I'm going to give you, you don't have to answer I, that I, one I because think, it's more of a Rachel or Prime, Prime Minister, Minister question. We're, we're, well, we're, but, but you we're, can, we're working together right on this. And okay. this meeting yesterday with Ban Ki-moon. So I think you should Absolutely. talk about your initiative. Very polite. Yeah. No, here, here I think you need to do uh, both. Um, so there has to be regional leadership. For example, Narendra Modi, uh, he is working on very specific programs, including the, the Holy Ganges River, uh, cleaning India, and, and um, I've spoken numerous times with him, with large groups of Dutch companies who can help him uh, to be more successful, of course, to, to, in conjunction with Indian, Indian companies to do this. Uh, so you need the local, uh, regional in this case, and India is now, I think, the second biggest country in the world in, in size of uh, its size of population. So it is uh, at this stage uh, one of the biggest uh, uh, countries in the world and one of the top uh, ten. Um, and then when you are uh, um, uh, particularly discussing um, um, companies like India, it is not only about climate um, uh, mitigation; it's also about climate adaptation. You have to make sure that uh, uh, things are safe and sound. For example, we have worked from the Netherlands in Bangladesh, making sure that uh, Bangladesh stays dry, the feet stay dry. Uh, with, in Indonesia, with Jakarta, which is uh, basically um, uh, sinking every year a couple of centimeters and working with them to make sure that uh, Jakarta uh, can maintain as a capital and stay safe. We are doing this in Latin America, in South Africa, other places. Uh, and we have established this global commission adaptation, the global center on adaptation. And the good news yesterday was that China is now opening a regional office in China on this issue of adaptation. And the World Bank has decided to spend half of its money, not half its money on, on, on climate mitigation, half of its money on climate adaptation. So there's 50 billion in five years. We were yesterday in that meeting. 50 billion in five years. So there's a fantastic, uh, fantastic sum. And Bill Gates and Kristalina. Uh, Georgieva and uh, General Secretary Ban Ki-moon, the previous General Secretary of the UN, they are leading that whole group. And, and from the Netherlands and others, and Angela Merkel, Theresa May, and many other leaders, including the Render Modi, uh, we are supporting that, uh, that process. So we, ha we have also to focus on adaptation, not only on mitigation, because we, the, the small island development states to India, but also my own country, uh, if the sea levels would rise even further, we have to also work on adaptation. Do you see sea levels rising in terms of the systems that you have in place in your country? Well, what we, we are at this moment have to think again about our dikes. Right. Uh, because sea levels are rising. And people don't want these old concrete big dikes uh, behind which houses are basically, basically disappearing. So we are now designing this new system, building with nature, which is, for example, creating small artificial islands in the sea, which would then change the course of water in, in such a way that... Uh, the, the waterfront itself is less vulnerable to the rising sea levels. So we're putting in place all these new things, but also some very old ideas. Eh? For example, we were used to build our farms on a yeah, terp, we call that, eh? sort of small hill, which was man-made. And this was a technology from the 12th and 13th century. Mm -hmm. We're doing it again. 
in some of our provinces in the Netherlands where we see the rivers rising and there is an increasing risk that rivers will overflow. So again, we are sometimes now building our farms on small man-made small hills on, uh, where livestock can retreat in case the rivers would overflow. And we are also implementing that in money-wise quite cheap technology in many other parts of the world. We've been on the cutting edge for centuries, as you were saying. It's, yeah, it's interesting, interesting to see right? that some of these yeah. techniques from 800 years ago are right. still valid today. Could I go ahead, just sure, very, very sure. briefly just go back to the question? Yeah. The, the, there's good news and bad news. The good news is that for those people who don't have access to much energy or to any energy, which is about a billion people in the world, the, 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 the new technologies of distributed modern renewable energy are by far the cheap, cheapest and quickest way to get them reli reliable and affordable energy. Mm -hmm. uh, and you see, you see that happening uh, obviously very quickly in India, but now through work like you and others uh, elsewhere in the Himalayas, it's, it's happening in the small island states and it's happening now in East Africa and now really some stuff really beginning to start moving quickly in West Africa. Uh, the bad news is that even though we know that this is the answer, very, very little um, private investment by, uh, domestically from, uh, from uh, I think mean, India's probably an outlier, but if you, look at the, if you look in Africa, very little domestic investment from Africans yeah. into that is happening. Very little private investment is still flowing into it. And almost no, uh, or nothing like the amount of concessional finance from multilaterals like the World Bank, Africa Development Bank, or from bi bilaterals, you know, from the UK, etc. You know, OECD countries and their aid. This is not yet flowing uh, anywhere near enough into the off-grid renewable solutions which are available. And we're going to have to speed that up because otherwise these people will not be able to participate in the growth story of their economies. So the good news is we can do it cleanly and affordably. Bad news is we haven't actually put our money where our mouth is yet. Yeah, great. We're, we're running a little short on time, so question here. Thanks. In the German newspaper Handelsblatt, there was three, four weeks ago statistics that said... Can you uh, identify yourself, please? I'm sorry. Can you identify yourself? My name is uh, Wolfgang Scheider. I'm CEO of uh, Automatic, uh, Auto, uh, Automobile uh, Group. <laughs> um, in the uh, German paper Handelsblatt, there was recently a statistic three, four, uh, four weeks ago that uh, there are more than 550 50 coal power plants built in Asia, and that is the equivalent. It was by far more than the whole CO2 emission of Germany. And I would like to know what, what do you do from the political side that Katowice is not just a nice convention and some signatures, but that the real thing is happening because it doesn't look like it. Maybe I'm wrong, but reading those statistics, I'm doubtful. So there is a very specific problem. Um, well, first of all, coal—it cannot. Coal is not a part of the story going forward. The speed with which uh, countries transition away from coal is going to be different. Um, but we have uh, a number of countries in in Southeast and East Asia who um, are, a plan, are building and plan to build a, a number of coal-fired power plants. <coughs> Put yourself in their shoes, right? They're getting subsidized um, technology, uh, subsidized finance, and sometimes even subsidized feedstock, right? From countries that signed the Paris Agreement. <laughs> uh, yep. um, and there's no like-for-like -like solution on offer easily available. So you can build a coal-fired power plant you know, and you know, reasonably cheaply because it is, somebody's going to help you do it. And you know that you can connect it into your grid and it will operate and you know you can do it in two or three years' time and you've fulfilled an electoral promise to increase generation. Right? So what we have to be able to do as an international community is say, OK, um, but here's a better offer. Uh, here's the technical assistance on grid stabilisation and everything else that you need. Here's the assistance that you need in order to move your regulation forward. And here's the subsidised finance or the finance that's easily available and can be quickly applied for you to have storage and modern renewables or gas or something else, right? So we, haven't, we, we know that we have to help these countries transition, but frankly, we haven't put a package on the table that's attractive enough at the moment. And, and, and the good news for me is that some of these things are being talked about here. Great. Okay, Last so question the, here. The, the, let me, let, can we just get, because this is very place. patiently. I'm Hi. so sorry. No, no, no. So maybe, maybe he'll get the question to you. Sorry, Fike. Hi. Uh, my name's Michael Itzer. I'm the CEO of the ICAW. So the, pa the panel have been very candid 
today, so thank you very much for that. So I'd like to take you forward to 2050, and there's a completely new generation sitting mm. on that podium. Mm -hmm. How are they going to assess our leadership today on this issue? <laughs> you have four minutes. Uh, <laughs> less than that, because we have to wrap up. It's just a quick thought. Will there be more women on the panel in 2050? Yeah, I agree. on that. <laughs> I agree with that. I bought you some time. I bought you some time. <laughs> Thank you, Rachel. Uh, by the way, I agree with you. Diversity is one of the, mm -hmm. of, of the big things. Diversity of sort. Um, if we don't move fast, and if we don't unlock the private sector money, which we talked, and if governments uh, are not helping us fast enough to unlock the money, the next generation will look very, very sad to us. We had a good time, we had a good drink, we had good food, we had a good life, and we transmitted the burden to them. And that is irresponsible. And I think your point, I cannot predict how they will look to us. And I hope, that's the only hope I can have, is I hope they will look to us that we showed leadership. And I would feel awful if we cannot show that. And it is up to us still now, here in Davos at those sessions, to decide on how they will look to us. And it's up to us to fill that in right now. Great. Christian, do you have a final thought on that one? <laughs> how can you beat that, right? OK. Uh, I absolutely agree, right? I, think, I don't think we should go into the mode of uh, it's too late and nothing can be done, right? That we should never do that. I think we should see the future as a, it's our choice, right? Our collective choice. And each of us has to contribute and try to make sure that 2050 people look at it and there will be changes, right? There will absolutely be changes, but we will say it's maybe one of the first challenges where humanity had to come together. That's maybe the opportunity. Yep. Great. Thank you for that great question because it really kind of capped uh, the whole session, I thought. And I, I think we really got to um, understand the complexity of the problem and the solutions and how important the coordination will be between NGOs and companies and governments. So please join me in thanking this great panel, Majun um, and Christian Monother, Rachel Kite, Fredo and particularly the leadership by Prime Minister Ruta. Thank you very much. Thank that was really wonderful. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you for your leadership. Thank you.